supporters, and I'm sure many other people do, as a peaceful protest against the Israeli oppression. Support groups have got to keep proclaiming the rights of the Palestinians are the right to return, the right to um, the right to their homeland. Actually, direct people towards some signs over here. If you'd like to grab a sign and hold it, there's a variety of them. It's important to send a message to people who are walking by. Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Long live Palestine! Long live Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Long live Palestine! Long live Palestine! Not another nickel! Not another dime, no more money for Israel's crimes, not another nickel, not another dime, no more money for Israel's crimes, not another nickel, not another dime, no more money for Israel's crimes. All right, thank you. I want to introduce our first speaker and co-chair of our event today. Uh, this is Hamza, who is a medical student at University of Vermont Medical School. He's helped organize med students in solidarity with Gaza and with the encampments up at UVM this past spring. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Salaam alaikum, peace be upon you all. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out today from the bottom of my heart to all the healthcare workers here, the healthcare students and to everyone from the community standing in solidarity with the people of Palestine. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. 240 days. After 240 days, there isn't much left to say. We spent these 240 days and beyond that, decades upon decades, trying to get people to understand that Palestinians are human beings who deserve to live in dignity on their own land. Trying to convince people that genocide and apartheid and ethnic cleansing are wrong and should be stopped. We've rephrased our horror and objections and commitment to resistance in thousands of eloquent and passionate ways. And I'm sure there will be many more today and at every gathering that we have in solidarity with the Palestinian people in Gaza and all of Palestine and the, around the world. Because we will not stop. Not until Palestine is free, until Sudan is free, until the Congo is free, until people everywhere are free to live in dignity. We are in the Imperial Corps, the heart of the Death Star. So we have a responsibility to use that proximity to maintain our momentum and to keep hope. A uh, quick aside, I saw a video a few weeks ago of Zionist counter-protesters literally playing Darth Vader's theme song, The Imperial March. You can't make this stuff up. Now before I introduce the next speaker, I want us all to take a moment to remember why are we doing this? Who are we doing this for? Two million in Gaza, 1.4 million in Rafah alone, 40,000 dead, 80,000 injured. These are not just numbers to be thrown into a news article, not just images on your Instagram or Twitter feed. Each one is an individual, unique, precious human life. Going forward, and as I'm sure many of us have, I hope that we can remember not just the numbers, but the people they represent. Think about the people that really impacted you, that hit you in your core, that gave you hope, that filled you with rage, that made you cry, and intentionally encode that memory, that emotion in your heart. For me, it's the medical student, also named Hamza, who died around November. 
the little girl who was murdered by Israel who is planning her birthday party. The video of children singing and one girl whose face had been completely burnt. So when you think about Gaza, when you see those numbers, when you attend these actions, recall those memories. If we want to convince the world that Palestinians are human beings, the first step is to make sure we continue to recognize that ourselves. Free Palestine. Our next speaker is uh, Samia. Uh, Samia is a Palestinian American activist and organizer and mental health worker based in Southern Vermont. She's a co-founder of the group Southern Vermont for Palestine, which is a proud member of the Vermont Coalition for Palestinian Liberation. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza, Sanam, everyone. Um, thank you for being here, and thank you to the organizers of Vermont Healthcare Workers for Palestine for making this happen. Yeah, give them a round of applause. Um, so as was stated earlier, I'm Palestinian, and I'm a therapist in community mental health. I work with youth, and I believe this is important because I see youth as the carriers of our intergenerational struggle for liberation. We've certainly seen that in the context of Palestine with the student uprising, the student intifada that began this spring. I work in mental health, so a lot of what I see and experience is people's internal suffering, but I am also a practitioner of liberation psychology, which tells us that our internal selfhood and our ability to be well in the world is inextricably tied to the collective, to our connections, and to the systems that we are embedded in. When I start working with the youth, I usually ask them and explore with them, what do you dream about? What's your vision? A while back after the start of the genocide, I heard a terrible piece of data quoted in a news story that when asked about their mental health, children in Gaza said, we have no dreams. We used to have dreams, now we have no dreams. We can't imagine that our lives will ever go back to normal. So I wanna talk about two things today. One is some framing about what's happening in Gaza and Rafah and what the systemic infrastructure of apartheid and occupation has to do with health. And the second is what we can do as healthcare workers and community members in Vermont across all of our networks to step in together and collectively further the cause of Palestinian liberation. Palestine is as much a local issue as a global one, and it has become a rallying cry for all of us everywhere, fighting for an end to U.S. imperialism, Western hegemony, and settler colonialism. So thinking about health care, I asked the question, what does health look like in Gaza today? We could ask, what is health in the face of genocide? What is care in the context of occupation and systemic annihilation? This is a snapshot of what health looks like in Gaza today. 40,000 people, two thirds of them women and children have been killed and another hundreds have been killed in the West Bank, not talked about often in the media. Over 1.7 million people, more than 75% of Gaza's population have been displaced and thousands have been displaced from Rafah. Israel has consistently, since the very start of this genocide, blocked necessary aid from getting to the people who need it. In fact, a bill introduced in the Israeli parliament just this week would designate UNRWA as a terrorist organization. Shame. Shame. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, many of them children, are at risk of death, starvation, and lifelong illness due to the living conditions, if you can call them living conditions, being enforced by the Zionist occupiers UNICEF estimates that a thousand children have lost limbs, many of them injuries that at one point would have been reconstructable, but malnourishment is keeping wounds from healing. Experts are decrying that even if proper aid entered tomorrow and got to the people who need it, the damage to their bodies will be lifelong. Meanwhile, the United States and Genocide Joe have shown that there are no red lines when it comes to Gaza. A State Department report in May falsified its findings to absolve Israel of responsibility for blocking humanitarian aid against the advice of its own experts, and even though the report also found that it was quote-unquote reasonable to assess that Israel has used U.S. weapons to commit war crimes. Shame. In Ukraine, oh, sorry. 
<laughs> also this month, Alex Smith, a USAID contractor, resigned in protest over the Biden administration's active facilitation of the genocide. In his letter of resignation, he wrote, in Ukraine, we call for legal redress when people are victimized. We name perpetrators of violence. We even work with human rights organizations collecting evidence for international prosecution. When it comes to Palestinians, however, we avoid saying anything about their right to statehood, the abuses they're constantly suffering, or which powers have been violating their basic rights to freedom, self-determination, livelihoods, and clean water. This systemic destruction of health infrastructure in Gaza has been called the triad of death through famine, bombs, and injuries that victims cannot and will not recover from. This triad of horror speeds up the killing machine of the settler colonialist project and aids through collateral damage the ongoing death and destruction of Palestinians. The denial of the United States that it is wrong or that it's even happening adds another treacherous level of hypocrisy to this horror show. So let us speak the truth today. Zionism is a health crisis. Settler colonialism is a health crisis. Racism is a health crisis. Occupation is a health crisis. Apartheid is a health crisis. Genocide is a health crisis. Our statewide coalition is focusing its efforts on the Apartheid Free Campaign now. This campaign offers us real, tangible actions that we can take in our cities and towns and locales across Vermont. There are two main pieces of the campaign. One is to get as many organizations, unions, faith groups, whatever you can think of, to pledge and commit the, to the Apartheid Free Language, which organizers have here today, right here at the table. This pledge is a commitment to resist apartheid and racism and to withdraw support of the Israeli apartheid state and to be in collective struggle against it. Yeah. The other part of this campaign is to create a swath of ballot measures across Vermont that will push towns and cities in our state towards becoming apartheid free and cutting ties to apartheid. In Burlington, that means organizers are gathering hundreds of signatures again to bring back the referendum to the city, and you can sign your name today and volunteer to get signatures. You can find Wafik or anyone with a clipboard. Amo, wherever you are. <laughs> um, and finally, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a nationwide call for people to show up in D.C. on Saturday, that's next week, June 8th, to wear red and circle the White House to be the red line that Biden and his administration has failed to keep. We're sending a bus from Vermont and you can be on that bus. It's a big push, but this is a time to make sacrifices and do what we can to show up. If you're not able to be there yourself, you can buy a solidarity seat for someone else as well. Together, we will create a strong, steadfast, statewide network in Vermont that stands against apartheid and stands in solidarity with Palestine. We are the political will of this country and we must be its moral compass. The AFC language and the actions that stem from it is our weapon against oppression. We the people stand for solidarity with Palestine, for liberation of oppressed people, a right to dream of liberated futures, health care for all, an end to the prison state, clean water and air, and for socialist futures where we can be well and whole and free, and where we can dream. In closing, I offer you these words that were said at the People's Conference for Detroit, for Palestine in Detroit a couple of weeks ago, a historic convening of over 3,500 people. Each of us is not one. We are hundreds. We are building a movement of humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. In our hundreds, in our millions, we are all Palestinians. In our hundreds. We are all Palestinians in our hundreds. We are all Palestinians in our hundreds. We are all Palestinians. I want to call up our next speaker. Amalia Kane is a family medicine provider here in our community. 
Uh, she'll be speaking in just a second. I wanted to also direct people's attention to a, a nurse at NYU who was recently disciplined for daring to use the word genocide in her remarks when she was being rewarded or awarded um, by NYU by her employer. She was given an award for her work with women and children in the labor and delivery unit, and she dared to express solidarity with women and children in Palestine, and for that she was fired. And when you listen to the remarks, the, the facts that Samia just laid out, there is no other word for this but genocide. There's nothing, there's no other word that could even come to mind. These are war crimes that they are carrying out every day, over and over again with our money. Amalia similarly dared to use the word genocide in a communication with other healthcare providers, encouraging them to come to a solidarity vigil with students at the encampment at UVM, and for that she was disciplined as well. It's genocide. We have to keep spreading the word. We have to keep talking about why this cannot continue, particularly with funding from the United States, but it cannot continue on a human level. Amalia Kane. Thank you for taking the time to be here. I am Dr. Amalia Kane. I studied global health at Middlebury College here in Vermont and then I went to medical school at Mount Sinai in New York City. I came back to Vermont for residency in family medicine here at UVM. I am now a primary care provider here in our community. To my neighbors and healthcare colleagues here, we all have experience with a strange healthcare system. Clinics closed to new patients, a hospital that needs to push discharges to make space. This work isn't easy. Now close your eyes. Imagine taking away reliable electricity, sufficient antibiotic and anesthetic supplies, clean water, enough food, add in internally displaced persons sheltering, frequent violent raids, fear for the safety of your family and your own life. The healthcare system in Gaza has been decimated through systematic attacks from the IDF since October. UNICEF documents 442 attacks on healthcare in Gaza. Mass graves have been found at hospitals. According to a recent report by the Healthcare Workers Watch Palestine, more than 500 healthcare workers have been killed. Most recent attacks include the bombing of an emergency room in Rafah. Those hospitals still running are so overwhelmed with patients with conflict-induced trauma injuries that there is no capacity to manage chronic care needs. In the face of deliberate attacks on healthcare, we cannot remain silent. In the words of Desmond Tutu, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Our colleagues are practicing in impossible conditions right now. Dr. Hamam Alo, a nephrologist at Al Shifa Hospital, was asked in an interview on October 31st why he wouldn't evacuate with his wife and two children in the face of increasing danger. And if I go, who treats our patients? We are not animals. We have the right to receive proper health care. You think I went to medical school? and my postgraduate degrees for a total of 14 years, so I think only about my life and not my patients? Do you think this is the reason I went to medical school? To think only about my life. Two weeks later, he was killed in an Israeli airstrike. Dr. Alo died because he refused to believe that his life was worth more than his patients. An icon in the global health world Paul Farmer wrote, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. That's right. It is shameful that our country is providing weapons for these attacks and that our medical system has remained silent. I am also a new mom of a wonderful 10-month-old. Motherhood has been the most amazing experience of my life. It feels true to me that your heart is now outside of yourself. I think about her needs and safety constantly. 
how do you parent when you can't find safety? Just last week, Israel bombed a tent camp housing displaced Palestinians in a designated safe zone. 45 people in Rafa were killed, most of them women and children. In a country where acute malnutrition was previously unseen, MSF has recorded an alarming upward trend in the number of children, pregnant women, and new mothers with acute malnutrition. Rafa is experiencing catastrophic food insecurity. Unsanitary living conditions also speed the spread of infectious disease, which are felt more severely when the body is already weak. A malnourished new mother cannot produce milk to breastfeed. Without formula and clean water, infants are starting their lives starving. This harm will have long-lasting effects. MSF reports Gaza's health system stands shattered. Rebuilding will span years, if not decades. For humanity to prevail, policymakers must understand the human cost of destroying an entire healthcare system. This must stop now. And in the big picture, the way to rebuild is not just through donations, medical missions, or foreign aid work. It is through Palestinian self-determination and liberation. There can be no peace without freedom, justice, and the right to self-determination. Free, free Palestine. Long live Palestine! Long live Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Free, free Palestine! Long live Palestine! Long live Palestine! Up next we have Heather Bowman, a phlebotomist and, uh, at UVMMC and the president of the Support Staff United Union. It's lovely to be here. Um, I work at the Medical Center. I'm proud to be in a union with 2,200 diverse, low-wage, unionists, hard workers who come from different life experiences, different educational experiences. But just recently, we got together and we realized that we shared common struggle. Yes. That, yes. that we, together, were facing alone the same problems, but that if we stood together, we could take up the mantle of our power and affect change. <laughs> Through these hard conversations, we recognized our struggles in others. We realized that we were laboring in unsafe working conditions and wages that were so low that we couldn't afford to care for ourselves and our families. And we joined together, we organized, and we started to affect change. But what was really powerful is when we started to see each other, others outside of our organization started to see us as well and offer their support and solidarity. And just about a year ago, we came to City Hall and all but one of the city councilors stood up and acknowledged our fight and stood with us in solidarity and offered support in our negotiations with the hospital. <laughs> It meant so much that they would acknowledge that our fight up on the hill was their fight here at City Council, that they would come out of themselves and see that they had an obligation to the other. And it really meant a lot to us, and it was a great demonstration of the obligation to see the other. We feel the same way. We felt the support from the nurses, and now we're able to offer our support to the nurses. And uh, as they go into their contract negotiations, we offer the same support to the UVM workers as they go into their negotiations. But what we also started to realize is that we have an obligation that extends not just to our hospital, not just to the other unions on the Hill, not just to the city of Bur Burlington or the state of Vermont. We have an obligation to acknowledge the struggles and the strife and the solidarity with the people of the world and the people of Palestine. Yeah. 
The Palestine General Federation of Trade Unionists has issued an urgent global call to action, and we stand to answer it. With more than 36,000 killed, primarily civilians and children, with more than 480 healthcare workers killed, we must stand, we must act. We have an obligation to educate ourselves. We have an obligation to acknowledge our complicity and boycott and divest. We have an obligation to take up the power that is ours and advocate and agitate for an apartheid-free community and an apartheid-free world. Thank you, Heather. What I think is so powerful about what Heather just said is that it demonstrates that if we organize, that if we fight, we can win. That's true when it comes to unions. It's true when it comes to Palestine. It feels so overwhelming right now, but we are seeing the thing, the, the tide starting to change. Israel is a pariah state. Most of the world says so. Most of the United States says so. We just don't get to hear about it. So we have to fight, we have to organize, and we can win. I want to introduce Leah Duckett next. She's a member of the Vermont Workers Center, a grassroots organization that fights for Medicaid for all. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you, healthcare workers for Palestine for organizing this. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk. Uh, my name is Leah Duckett. I'm a member of the Vermont Workers Center, the Poor People's Campaign, and the Nonviolent Medicaid Army. These groups organize for an end to poverty and a more just economy, including universal health care. And today, I'm going to try to answer the question of why we organize for health care in the US if we want to stop the genocide in Gaza. We organize for healthcare in the US because we have the greatest ability to stop the genocide within our own country. Changing our own country's economy will directly diminish the Zionist state's capacity for genocide. There is no Zionist state without the US, and there is no US in its current form without the exploitation of the poor and dispossessed here and in Gaza. So we want to be strategic now. The genocide in Gaza is an acute manifestation of the fundamental problem of our time. In his original Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Dr. King identified the fundamental problem of our time as the extreme concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, while an ever-growing majority are forced into poverty. This concentration of wealth results in the four evils of militarism, racism, poverty, and environmental destruction. And the continued concentration of wealth depends on those evils. Like the US military contractors and weapons manufacturers who make grotesque profits from this genocide. We have seen these evils inflicted on the people of Gaza by the Zionist state. Our economy funds this genocide and profits from it. The same system that kills Palestinians in Gaza is killing us here too. 140 million people in the US are living in poverty, are living paycheck to paycheck, or are one emergency away from financial ruin. That's 40% of our population, and it is growing every day. Poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. 800 people die in the US every day due to lack of basic necessities, like health care, housing, food, clean air, and water. The ruling class says that there is no money in our budget to meet these needs, yet they find hundreds of billions of dollars to send to Israel. Palestine's survival and our own depend on us solving this fundamental problem. We do this by transforming our economic system from one that profits off of mass death 
to one that ensures the basic needs of all people. As Reverend Dr. King outlined, we need a mass movement of the poor and dispossessed of every background that crosses all lines of division. The poor in this country are uniquely positioned to affect change. We have the least to lose and the most to gain. We organize for healthcare because it's strategic as well as life-saving. The healthcare crisis impacts all of us. 24 million people have lost their health care since the Medicaid cutoffs began post-pandemic, including 30,000 in Vermont. By impacting all of us, the health care crisis unites us as a class and therefore gives us power. The ruling class has come up with no effective means of solving this crisis despite years of public outcry, because there is no way for them to solve it and still maintain the status quo in which wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few. Universal healthcare would mean radically restructuring our economy for the better. We, the poor and dispossessed of the United States, have the revolutionary potential to fundamentally transform the global economic system which exploits and kills us, starting within our own country. We have the responsibility to organize and realize that potential. Not another nickel, not another dime, no more money for Israel's crime. Not another nickel, not another dime, no more money for Israel's crime. Not another nickel, not another dime, no more money for Israel's crimes. Uh, up next, I want to call up Kate, who's a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, Vermont, New Hampshire, and a nursing student. My name is Kate. I was raised in Burlington. I am a nursing student and a member of Jewish Voice for Peace, Vermont, New Hampshire. I organize with JVP in support of the liberation of Palestine and against Zionism because as a Jewish person, my conscience and my ancestors compel me to. I am here in total support of Vermont healthcare workers for Palestine's work towards apartheid free communities and an end to US aid to Israel. Right. As a former emergency tech and EMT, I've watched in horror as Israeli bombs obliterate hospitals murdering healthcare workers and their patients trying to heal and shelter inside. I cannot imagine the fear of Gazan nurses as Israeli soldiers storm their ICUs. I am in awe of the Gazan doctor's bravery to perform life-saving procedures, C-sections, amputations on patients without necessary medication. The U.S. and Israel claim that killing over 36,000 people in Gaza is necessary for Jewish safety. They claim Israel's 75-year history of occupying, displacing, and kidnapping millions of Palestinians is all necessary for Jewish safety. This is a perverse weaponization of Jewish traumas. The murder of my entire grandfather's family, shot in the streets of Vilnius during the Holocaust, does not permit unspeakable violence against Palestinians. That's right. We can never allow historical pain of a people to be used as a weapon of war. Right. Anti-Semitism, what keeps Jews unsafe, is bred by the fascist, white supremacist conflation of Zionism and Judaism. 
as long as leaders from a local to an international le level wield this dangerous conflation, I have an obligation to vocally reject it. That's right. In fact, it is to deeply honor our ancestors' suffering and resilience to speak out and act out against this injustice, not in our name. That's right. Never again means never again for anyone. Never again means nothing if it does not include Palestinians. Never again is now. If you are a Jewish person feeling isolated from your Jewish institutions, know that you are not alone. There is a vibrant, justice-driven community at JVP ready to welcome you home into the work of liberation. Right. And as an aspiring nurse, I have a duty to my colleagues in Palestine. I have a duty to learn from their courage and act with it along my fellow workers, alongside my fellow workers, to ensure that within our lifetimes, Palestine will be free. Thank you, Kane. Israel, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Biden, Biden, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Israel, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Biden, Biden, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Israel, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Biden, Biden, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. I want to talk about the fact that more than 514 healthcare workers have been killed so far in Israel by the Israeli occupation forces. 244 Palestinian healthcare workers have been unlawfully detained, and of those, at least 24 have given testimony after they were released that they were brutally tortured. There are 43 missing healthcare workers in Palestine. Every day, Healthcare workers in, Israel, in Palestine talk about having a target on their back. There are accounts actually of patients giving them civilian clothes so that as they leave the hospitals and the healthcare facilities, they will not be targeted. It's got to stop. Our next speaker is Crystal from the Vermont Workers Center. Um, she will be speaking, she's actually a mental health worker, but will be starting as a history teacher next year and is looking forward to sharing the true, the true stories and histories of colonial settler apartheid. Hi everyone, uh, my, yeah, my name is Crystal. Um, I currently work for the Howard Center. I work in mental health. Um, and yeah, I will be starting next year as a history teacher. And I wanted to talk about two things. I wanted to talk about decolonization, um, but first I wanted to ground it and make connections in our experiences. Um, so I'm gonna share an experience that I think, it isn't necessarily unique to um, you know, care workers and healthcare workers, but it's certainly one we see every day, which is we will be working with clients, working with patients, and we run up to the limitations of our system where it's, you know, I, I wish we could help you more, I wish we could do these things that we know you need, but the limitations of our system mean that we can't do that. Um, and I'm sure, without even explaining, other healthcare and care workers here know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, the issue isn't like, oh, just this one thing on your leg, this, it's capitalism and your ability to access the care that you need, um, or in the case of my personal experience with mental health, things related to their class background are exacerbating these mental health conditions. But my job isn't gonna allow me to fix these problems, all I can do is try and come up with a plan to make it a little bit better in the meantime. And this is a limitation of our system. And in the same way, um, we've been showing out you know, all the time. Um, we've been doing marches, we've been doing rallies, we've been, well, some people have, we won't say any names, but people have been at the encampment. If the police ask, we don't know who. Um, and you know, we've been doing a lot of really great stuff, and yet our president, who is a Democrat, by the way, I just want to make that clear, both parties have made it very clear that they're going to continue to support this genocide in Gaza. And this is another limitation of our system. So clearly just like, you know, asking nicely to keep the system the same and hope things will change is not working. It's just not working. Now when we talk about that system, 
more so than just being a part of it, we are complicit, right? When we are working at UVM, this, the, for example, I don't work at UVM, but like UVM nursing staff. UVM, before hiding its endowments, uh, donated generously to Israeli companies. It had its retirement, like pensions in uh, like, um, shoot, what are they called? BlackRock and Vanguard and other companies that invested heavily in war companies, war profiteering companies and other Israeli businesses. Um, and more locally, for example, um, and I guess in a more personal one, I'm a transgender woman and I used hormones from Planned Parenthood. I found out last week Planned Parenthood donates about three million a year to Raytheon. Shame. And now their excuse is, oh, it's for, you know, our IT system or whatever. And it's like, the thing is, I don't want to live in a system where, okay, the company that you're paying to do your IT is also funding bombs that kill, thus far, since October, more than 40,000 people. And I also think it's particularly hypocritical for a company to say, like Planned Parenthood, to say, we care about reproductive justice when that company is bombing pregnant women, when it is destroying hospitals to keep pregnant women from giving safe birth, when it is killing gynecologists, when it is keeping these women in Gaza from having access to reproductive care. That's not reproductive health at all. So, that brings us to the here and now. How did we get where we are in Palestine, not in Israel, in Palestine, and how do we get here where I, a white person, I'm talking to a bunch of, oh, mostly, other white people here on Abnaki land? The answer is colonialism. And as a history teacher, and the reason I wanted to bring that up is because as a history teacher, we look for patterns. We look for science, just like you do in healthcare, right? Oh, and another thing I want to mention, I'm going off on a lot of tangents here. When I mention this about Planned Parenthood, that's not unique. Many people who work in healthcare know this, if you've ever heard the name Henrietta Lacks. She was a black woman who had a cancerous tumor removed without her consent because the doctors were like, oh, these cells are really interesting. We can do tests on this. The reason that we have so many vaccines and so many amazing things today that objectively have made life better for all of us is on the backs and exploitation of the black and brown women of, that were here in this country, either before us or right here by force. So that is to say, this life we live, this amazing standard of life we have, comes at the price of the exploitation of black and brown people, of people overseas, of people in Gaza. I don't stand for that, and none of us should. Now, thank you, thank you. So, the reason I mention this, and I mention my history teacher future background, what I'll be going into, is to say that just like we recognize the patterns of science, you know, just as we recognize like these patterns of psychology to care for mental health, history teachers and historians in general do the same. We study the patterns of history and see what repeats itself. Now I mentioned here, we're standing on Abnaki land and again, most of us are, possibly none of us have any Abnaki background. What we're seeing right here is the future for Gaza if we do not stop this genocide. Because what happened, we brought, the settlers brought to America, they formed colonies and brought the system of colonial, of capitalism rather, displaced, killed, what have you, the native people. And in fact, I think in particular, about 150 miles southwest of here, King Philip's War was an example that mirrors exactly what we saw on October 7th. The Wampanoag people, who had been displaced again and again and again, had their land stolen, had their, you know, access to, like, nature, access to, like, open water for fishing, cut off, they were displaced, they launched an attack on the settlers. And what did the settlers say after 70-something years of forcing them out, taking their things? They said, look at these savages. They called them subhuman. The exact same thing that we're seeing said about the resistance fighters in Palestine right now. This is directly one-to-one -one the exact same thing we are seeing that happened here in America hundreds of years in the past. We are seeing a resistance to colonialism. So I'm going to end with this. The issue here is colonialism. It is what has allowed us to be so powerful and so wealthy and have such an amazing quality of life here today at the, at the expense of the native people of this land. And that is what is happening in Gaza right now. Israel is displacing the native people, the native Palestinians, stealing their land, taking control of the oceans, and it is colonizing the area. So what we need to do is we can feel guilty, and we should. 
but we have the luxury of just sitting here feeling guilty. We need to do more than that. We need to educate ourselves, organize, and fight back against it. That means signing the Apartheid Free Burlington Pledge. That means learning the history. And in particular, I want to lead with this. The history seems very complicated. It seems very overwhelming. Even as a history teacher, well, to be history teacher, it's a lot that I have to learn, and there's a hell of a lot I'm sure I don't know. But you need to start somewhere. So please, everyone, go to decolonizepalestine.com. That's decolonizepalestine.com. That's a website made by two Palestinian men in their free time. They're not paid for it. It is just for the sake of sharing the history of their land that is being stolen right now. Once more, that's decolonizepalestine.com. Please take some of your free time to learn the true history, learn what actually happens there, not just what we've been told about the people in Gaza. Learn the truth and yeah, free Palestine. <laughs> In our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians. In our millions, in our billions, we are all Palestinians. In our thousands, in our millions, we are all Palestinians. In our millions, in our billions, we are all Palestinians. Before I introduce the next speaker, um, I want to point out uh, a resource for those of us who uh, want to learn more about the experience of healthcare workers in Gaza right now. Um, Gaza Medic Voices is a social media account on all social media platforms that was uh, started by workers, uh, physicians from uh, Doctors Without Borders. It has first-hand accounts from uh, healthcare workers in Gaza relaying their experiences uh, with this current genocide. So if you want to learn more about what that uh, first-hand experience is, uh, go check out Gaza Medic Voices. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Theo. Uh, Theo is, um, works, for, works with Labor for Palestine, is a former registered nursing assistant and a current labor organiz organizer for the Nurses Union and Support Staff Union. Theo has gone door to door advocating for Medicare for All and knows nothing will get better if you don't step up and fight back. It's not just Palestine, is it? It's the daily indignities of working, working longer hours for less. No real voice at work. Fear of losing your license because you're being pushed to always do more with less. More with less. More and more with less and less. The same people, admin, health execs, bosses, billionaires, whose media told us we can't afford Medicare for all, despite every other country having it. The same people who now tell us that Israel-Palestine is so complicated. Who tell us that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. What's complicated about spending a trillion dollars of our money every year on 900 military bases around the world, including the unsinkable aircraft carrier that is Israel? And what's really anti-Semitic is the Zionist lie that safety for Jews must be conquered through ever-escalating bloodthirsty belligerence, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, genocide. Anti-Zionist Jews all around the world have rejected that slanderous false choice. The path to peace starts with Biden defunding Israel. Right. It's not just Palestine, is it? Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Cuba, and lesser known imperialism, Chile, Congo, Indonesia, the Jakarta method. And it's not just Palestine, is it? It's the moral injury of unsafe staffing. Not enough time to take care of your parents or children yourself. Or not enough money to pay for childcare because the cost of living goes up faster than wages. It's not just Palestine, is it? It's admin, legislators, bosses, and billionaires forcing us to do more with less so that the rich can get richer. So wars for profit can proliferate like wildfire. 
It's not just Palestine, is it? It's microplastics in mother's milk. It's plummeting biodiversity. PFAS in the lake and the drinking water. It's polycrisis, climate change, the sixth extinction, a daily doom scroll of grim headlines, crop failures, famines, floods, fires, lead in the pipes. In short, it's capitalism, a dictatorship of the billionaires, and we're all cannon fodder. But it doesn't have to be like this. Another world is possible. The cause of labor is the hope of the world because without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. <laughs> Workers came together to end World War I, to end Vietnam, and to end apartheid in South Africa. We've done it before, and we can do it again. It starts with you. What are you willing to do to build power and win the world you deserve? Will you talk to your coworkers and your colleagues? Will you organize? Will you give one hour of your week to build an organization? Without organization, we are nothing. We are powerless. Divided we beg, united we bargain. This war machine doesn't function without labor. And it takes organizing, talking to your coworkers and your colleagues to get strike ready and make ourselves heard. Look at UAW 4811 in California. That's right, I think a lot of you already know. These workers show us the way forward. 48,000 grad workers saw their Zionist admin censoring their freedom of speech and smashing their freedom of assembly and freedom to organize with the concussive blows of armored police. These grad workers said enough is enough and organized, and now 48,000 workers are collectively saying, hell no. Labor history and our present moment makes clear how much potential power we can unleash. The first step is organizing. What are you willing to do to build power and win the world you deserve? It starts with you. Come talk to a volunteer organizer from Healthcare Workers for Palestine or Labor for Palestine. Let's talk. We have so much potential power, but we have to get organized to win. Closing in on our final speakers, and I, I want to thank everyone who has spoken so far. I feel like I've learned so much, and I feel so inspired, and it's so good to see people taking a stand. We are nurses, we are doctors, we are healthcare workers, we're phlebotomists, we're mental health workers. It's so important to have a united voice, and Theo just mentioned Healthcare Workers for Palestine. If you haven't already, please stop at our table and sign up so you can get involved. We're meeting every week. We're talking about what we can do to put pressure on our institutions to sign the Apartheid Free Communities Pledge, to divest, and much more. Um, we are going to hear briefly from Damien a little bit more about the, the demonstration in D.C., and then Jenny from, I'm sorry, Jenny Watkins, uh, who is an RN and granddaughter of a Jewish survivor of Nazis, Nazi Germany's genocide and co-founder of Vermont Healthcare Workers for Palestine, will be our final speaker. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. And that is the truth. My name is Damien. I'm an organizer with the PSL and a proud member of the Vermont Coalition for Palestine. And uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I have this idea. What do you think about a group photo with everybody's fists up? You want to do that? I got a wide angle right here. Come on, bring it in, bring it in. Come on, we got to consolidate. This is more than just a picture. Consolidation is what we need. You've heard over and over today that organization is what we need, right? So let's show everybody. Let's come on, let's get it together. Y'all want to put your fists up? Let's make some noise. Come on, Palestine. Yeah. We're gonna do this.
People are coming together from all sectors of society. We're put, we've had enough of their lies. We've had enough of the propaganda. We've had enough of the exploitation and the bombing and the killing. It just was uh, found out um, by an academic study that we're actually spending more than $1.5 trillion every year on the military war machine. And the Palestinian people are the vanguard in the fight against imperialism right now. They are doing it on their own, and it's an incredible sacrifice that they are making. They have lit the torch, and it is up to us to pick the torch up and burn this evil system down. So, everything that we're doing here, the Apartheid Free Communities Initiative, don't leave here if you're a Burlington voter without signing that initiative. Of course, we would declare this an Apartheid Free Community, of course. And if you live in another town other than Burlington, let's talk about what we need to do to organize this initiative in your town. So, um, with that said, we all know that Biden said that the invasion of Rafah would be his red line. And we all know that that was a lie. We know that their support for Israel has everything to do with our military interests in the, in the Middle East. And as a result, our answer for this ongoing atrocity, a refugee camp where people have been corralled, they have nothing, and they're bombing these people. And that was supposed to be the, the so-called red line. So we're actually going to do what is been the, the answer throughout history. We're going to come together, we're going to unify, and we're going to signal our collective power by surrounding the White House dressed in red. We are the red line. Yeah. So I invite you all, no matter what it takes, let's make this small sacrifice in our lives. If you, if you weigh and measure our, the sacrifice that it would take to make it to D.C., to, to get involved in the, uh, the Apartheid Free Community Initiative. It is just a scratch on the surface compared to the immense sacrifice that the Palestinian people have, have initiated, initiated. And we know this is what it means when people say Palestine will free us all. This is what it means. We are all Palestinians. So please do what you can to get to DC. Get out your red clothes. Let your friends and family know. Let's do this. We also, um, we're, we're organizing a bus, and uh, that's a, you know, a big part of what I'm up here to say today is like, get on the bus with us. If you don't have enough money to make it, we're gonna figure it out later. The important thing is just to get as many people there as we can. So there's uh, um, some information on the table. You can come find me, you can look on the internet, uh, Answer Coalition, Shut It Down for Palestine, um, Vermont, uh, uh, Party for Socialism and Liberation in Vermont uh, on Instagram. There's a number of different ways to find out um, what's going on, but please join us in, in DC. Let's, a week from today, be traveling back on the road, feeling successful that we, 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 that we came together and that we grew power together and that we stood against the most evil regime that's ever existed, the United States Imperial Machine. Sorry. <laughs> I get so nervous, man. Of course, like somebody up here, like me, I'm like a nervous little guy, and, uh, and here I am. But thank you. Let's go, Palestine! Hello, everyone. I'm Jenny. Thank you for coming today to build our networks and our collective voice and power in getting our institutions active against this genocide. The institutions we labor for and learn with will not continue in silence. That's right. There is such amazing community and organization in Vermont. Thank you so much to the Coalition for Palestinian Liberation, to Southern Vermont for Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace, Vermont and New Hampshire, Med Students for Palestine, and everybody here today. We hope you've been able to visit our table and get some more information. Also, if you haven't spoken with Wafiq, we're circulating, he's circulating another resolution to get ceasefire back on the ballot. Pardon me, it's for Apartheid Free Community Pledge. My mother's mother was born a German Jew and wound up the only surviving family member. She was released from a concentration camp to work for the German army, sewing their winter uniforms. 
and she encountered a former classmate on the street whose family took her into hiding. Please join me in saying, never again for anyone. Never again for anyone. Never again is now. Never again is now. In this group, Healthcare Workers for Palestine, we're a small local chapter of a national organization. We're coming together to harness and direct our power so our institutions and our representatives no longer support and profit from ethnic cleansing. I look forward to connecting with all of you more at our next meeting or action. We meet at 9.30 on Saturday morning by Zoom. We have an Instagram, Healthcare Workers for Palestine VT. We have a Gmail account that you can get at the table. Please connect with us. We wanted to close today with a poem. We have the words today of Hiba Abu Nada, who is a Palestinian poet, novelist, and educator. Her novel, Oxygen is Not for the Dead, won second place for the Sharjah Award for Arab Creativity in 2017. Hiba was killed in her home in the Gaza Strip by an Israeli airstrike on October 20th, 2023, at the age of 32. Today, we honor her and give gratitude for her words. This poem is called Seven Skies for the Homeland. In our lungs is a homeland and on our breath in exile, a homeland that rushes in our veins as our footsteps edge towards it. It grows in the groves of sorrow, a vine of strangers, glances like tears hanging. It gifted us its tune and gave up all the singing. Can we deny it, can it deny us, when it is our blood and we have mastered the bleeding? In our books, hunger and bread are synonyms, light and darkness, all broken shards. I have learned to find hope in the extremes of love and rain clouds in the desert of rhymes. It's a homeland that returns to us naked, but knows how to wrap us around it like robes. In our blood, it hides seas and launches ships with our heart throbs. It tucks our sidewalks in our pillows and its cities in our dreams. Will it slumber in us for eternity and continue to invent time again and again? Like these olive trees that stand as strangers, their colors and taste alien, there is no room for us in this universe. Like a narrow corridor, it closes in. It's as if we were scandals, our longing a crime, and the love of our country a sin. Thank you for being here with us today, everyone. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Long live Palestine. Long live Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Long live Palestine. Long live Palestine. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea. From the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Thank you, everyone, for coming out here today. Um, as was mentioned multiple times earlier, if you're a healthcare worker, please uh, check out uh, the table. Check out Healthcare Workers for Palestine, Vermont, New Hampshire, on Instagram. Uh, get involved. If you're not a healthcare worker, get involved with any one of the numerous organizations involved in the Vermont Coalition for Palestine. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the, our collective struggle for liberation is what will bring Pal get Palestine free, will bring freedom to us all. Um, so yeah, thank you. Woo!